Hey everyone, uh, I'm Akash Bhavna from Flipkart.com. Um, so I'll be talking about certain challenges we face at Flipkart.com and how we tackle them. I'm a UI engineer at Flipkart.com by the way. Uh, so just an overview of Flipkart content uh, before we get started with things. Uh, we do like more than 4 million pages a day. Uh, the good part is 40% of it comes from Chrome. 26% is Firefox and 20% is I, all I's. And good part is, I mean, 16% of, so 16% is I, very less of I6 and I7. So we use in our CD and serve static files. We'll be talking about this in detail uh, down line. So uh, we use PHP for front end, serving the front end, and we use jQuery and its libraries for our client side framework. Here is what we are going to talk about today. So we, this, these are the several challenges in the case of Flipkart.com. Uh, we wanted to make secure cross open calls. We wanted to serve the static contents in a way it's cost effective for us. And the latency also is not very high for the users. Web fonts, also, again, this was a big chance for us. Scalable CSS code, again, this was a big thing to maintain this. CSS is for a site as big as Flipkart.com and cleaning up gold code. This is, this, this is really tough for us because of the speed we are moving and the things things are changing quite fast. Um, so first we'll look at cross between transfer try frames. So we started to build out this digital store at Flipkart. Uh, the requirement was that we wanted people to purchase songs from search pages, browse pages, anywhere on Flipkart.com. These pages were on HTTP domain, and to do a one click checkout on these pages, we, we don't want to, com to, to compromise on the security of calls. We wanted to the, the checkout to happen through secure channel. So we have to we had to make secure calls between the CDP and the HTTPS domain. This was really challenging for us because we are already downloading a bunch of JS on the page, and we don't want to use a Another level like XDM or another big level for cross domain calls. So, we set out to build a very thin, very lightweight cross domain calls library. We'll be talking about this in more detail. So, we, the requirements were that we wanted to post requests between the HTTP and the HTTPS pages, and we never wanted the page to reload. You know, we wanted to be on the same page uh, when he makes a purchase, when he makes a digital purchase. Uh, it's cross browser, even i6 is supported. We wanted i6 because we want people on i6 to be able to do transactions to the very least. This is used across a lot of things in the card your sign up, your login, your, your one click purchase for digital items, and over the time, this will be used a lot over the card. We want it to be fast and lightweight. We want it to be able to transfer megabytes of data to pages. If we look at the approaches which are followed right now, they are people use a window location hash for transferring data, which is which you cannot which has its own limitations. We have to pull for it, we have to pull the hash, and there's a limit on the size of data you can transfer between the page to that. So these were the requirements we were building against. And so we researched that window.post message is our friend. So window.post message is available across wide variety of browsers, i8 plus, Firefox, C++ plus, and all modes basically. So this allows us to send data between frames, one, one frame posts a message to another frame and another frame, frame uh, listens for it. But there is just one quick here that i8 will, will only allow you to transfer strings over it. It will type cast anything to string. You throw, you give it, you give it objects, it will type us into string. So we had to actually JSON encode it twice or JSON encode, we had to, we had to do a two string on all the data we transfer across the frames. So another thing was, another thing is window.name. Window.name is I think very less known uh, method to transfer across frames. This was, this is, this, this helps us transport a megabytes of data across pages. It's supported in i 6, 7 and all the old school browsers. So this, so again, yeah, it allows us to send megabytes of data across pages because it's 
window and name property is a like sending a setting a variable and reading it to the other side. It doesn't require a proxy iframe, it doesn't require polling and it's fully async. You see how the the resulting code looks like when we set up in this this was just a code. Just this response took care of all of our cross domain needs. So if you see here what we are doing is we are JSON encoding the data twice to convert it to string to convert an PHP array to string and we are checking if uh, post message is there, we are using post message otherwise we are simply setting the vendor.name and so the quick here is that even if you set vendor.name you won't be able to read it the other side to read it the other side you need the frame to be on the same domain the best way you could think of it was you would redirect to favicon.ico because that's, that's always cached and you redirect the frame to that location the frame will redirect to that location but window.name would remain the same that way we can access the variable in the top frame uh, so one small thing was that while you were doing this we messed up the back button of the browser uh, I, the iframes don't like the back button when you make calls through iframes it also creates a point in your history so this was really this was really serious for us because people could redo transactions when they click the back button and solution as it turned out was very simple once you are done with the request remove the iframe removing the iframe creates a history for the for that page there is no longer a request happening if you clear the iframe um, so in all CDN yeah so you might have heard of this from a uh, lot of sites on internet we have our own CDN we don't use a third party CDN for our static files uh, no packet for uh, flipcart.com goes out of India the highlights are very easy so we can actually in runtime we can switch our CDNs through configs so in case there is a high load some CDN service are non-performing there is a spike we can switch to an alternative provider or we can <coughs> pull that out of rotation through configs it gives us very high latency and it's very cost effective for us because we are doing like whole new pages a day and the CDN geo mapping we, we, we learned that the CDN geo mapping is cooler when you, you when people use Google DNS or Open DNS it no longer moves through the it no longer gives you the file from the latest from the from the nearest server and the lessons learned while we are developing this helped us in fine tuning the data stack and it also helped us in tuning other services also. Why why don't you using Google DNS to open DNS to work the geomapping? It happened actually in this state actually so the, the Google DNS will map the packet to Google and, and elsewhere and then it will come down. Um, yeah so web phone so when we were launching the Flipkart digital store or the free downloads we wanted it to look jazzy, we wanted it to have a different experience apart from, from the rest of the Flipkart so we decided to use webphones but as it turned out that webphones are not that easy I mean they have a lot of tricks with, associated with them they, these are the webcams you should keep in mind when you are using webphones you should always subset your phone if you use a font directly as people give them it will, it will be like 500 TVs and you will be downloading a hell lot of data on the client side just for every request and another thing is that you need to adjust the X side of the fonts so it turned out for us that when we started using these fonts the, our existing, with our existing CSS everything was sticking to top so because of, because of the fonts X side so it turned out that it's to, the font is like that only so we, we fixed it by adjusting the X side of the fonts there is a very good site called fontsprint.com it does a lot of optimizations for you it does it, it does it's subsetting it, it, it does excite for you it does everything for you you should be using it if you are using web tools on your page so another thing was people say that if you are using web phone we should use the external loader like the google lo web fonts loader the type in loader or anything else but that required us to download another 6-7 kbs of JS on every page which had this and we, we never wanted the packet to go out of India. We never wanted to have just for fonts another request and two, three requests for fonts. So we set out to build a solution on our own and it turned out that it's not that difficult actually if you, if you, if you follow uh, if you, if you research around it for a bit. 
So one thing was that that I will not enter anything if there is a script tag about the font. So the page will be blocked. People will see a white page. This was critical for us because we have people coming in from IE and they will see just a white page and the font loads and the uh, and this was happening even in the latest size also because see it happening. So you should always place the font tag on the top of your uh, page before any script tag. Otherwise, I will block it. Uh, I will block it since I will, I will block the download. Of, I will block the rendering of the page. Uh, so it, it turned out that Chrome and Firefox download the font only when they encounter text with that font. So let's say if you have a dialog with that font in, the dialog will be shown, but there will be no text shown until and unless the phone downloads. I the browser will download the phone only when it encounters it. <coughs> so the way the solution for this was to preload the font using a hidden span tag on the top of the page earlier. Um, so next is uh, OCSS. Uh, we love OCSS. I mean, I have not sure if you guys have heard of it. OCSS is a movement by Nicole Sullivan. She does CSS consulting for big organizations like Facebook and all, and high performance CSS optimizations. They do it's if you start using it, it's completely it's, it's a new approach to CSS writing CSS. One area is using less SAS and these things. This is using the existing CSS uh, class and writing it in a way that it's scalable. So OC is in a brief. OC just says that you should always separate skin and structure. If I'm defining a button, the structure for that button should be different and the the, the, the skin for that button should be different. If this is not the case, you will always find yourself duplicating the code. You should always separate your container and content. So container will container this is you should always have a grid framework with you. If you don't have a grid framework, you will end up duplicating containers everywhere. You should have containers and you should replace them better than them. This results in highly, highly reusable CSS code, but again, it's it's non-semantic, and if there are uh, you could argue that you will have to tell your CSS best practices for this. You have to put them aside if you are to go with this approach for finding your CSS. If you look at it, some of the OCSS bits we are looking at Flipkart. So bits, this is a this is a great framework we are using. It's very lightweight. It's it takes care of all the cross browser hacks we have put in, and it's very lightweight. It's very simple to use. Uh, it's cross browser and it's it's very extensible. You can nest the grid units, you can have the massage stack, whatever you want you can do with them. Um, this is a sort of, this is an example mark of a thread. So if you look at that, this will create a grid unit for me and it's very simple to it's very it's very easy to maintain it this way because like, if I have to change the size of any of the units, I just have to change the size one of three to one of two or something and it, Everything else should be, should, should be taken care of, and this also helps us nesting them. And if you see Flipkart, uh, you will see them everywhere, from three uh, column layouts to your yeah, product units. Everywhere you will see these units nested. Um, so some more OCS examples. So we use font. Uh, we have declared font only once. OCS says that you should declare things only once and you should be reusing them later on. So these are the some of the styles I've declared for font. If you have declared them once, everywhere we are using them. Again, if you're coming from the semantic side, if you look at this from the semantic side, it's not very semantic, but it works for us. Uh, we put a dummy semantic class name in case you find that it's going too much non-semantic. But yeah, we use a lot of classes like this, okay font small, okay font normal, okay font big for for having the different font sizes across site. We are also of the view that you should not declare a class just for margin or padding, just for moving around elements. If it's just that, we have created a lot of functional classes like our padding file. It says that okay, move the element, have a padding of five clicks from right for that element. We have we have like five, six classes like this and it works for us. It helps us not to declare the rules again and again. This is very, this, this has worked out in a big way for us and we have saved a lot of bytes with this. Um, so CSS load. 
So it's unavoidable actually when you have a when your when you are working with company like Tata, that things change rapidly every day, and it's very tedious to be. Like people will not actually go in and clean up the code. It's very tedious task. So we'll see that how we tackle this and how are we for what what the time we taking to clean up the code. So first, why the code loads? It's again it's all straightforward. Bad code people write things. Bad on top level selectors and override it at the subsequent levels. Uh, ultimately, a code is just overrides one level overriding the other. The other reason is stale and unused selectors. People uh, never delete rules. People will never refract delete rules from the CSS file. Uh, this is what we found out. If we have to do it. We have to take one day out of our day job and do it. It's very difficult to remove unused rules, and you will never know that I delete this rule. Will it affect any other piece on the website? So, redundant declarations. So, we ran a script all our, around all of the CSS code and we found out that these were the most declared CSS properties in this order explication, underline, explanation, and then. We had not set the, the anchor tag technically properly. So, we, we found out that people were overriding at a lot of levels and people were doing it quite often. We didn't use the recent.css initially because of that people were uh, setting margin zero for padding zero, body zero, and, and in a lot of CSS loops. Then again, we had a lot of loops which look like width 100%, display block, vector pointer, phone width hole. This is a result of people using wrong tags for uh, for, right, for for different things. So width 100% you could use a div, display block you could have used a div. Cursor pointer, they can have used the anchor tag, phone fit rule, they would have used a strong or a B tag. This is what we found out that these were the most declared CSS properties in our code. And when we set out the extractor, we, we, our efforts were driven towards having these, uh, removing these and having a top level rules which actually make, uh, which actually make people not declare them again and again. Um, so, CSS clean up the rule. Uh, so we have uh, so we have to clean the CSS code. People will not delete them manually because it's too much tedious. So we thought of we write a tool which will take in a bunch of yarns, it will take in a bunch of CSS files and tell us that this CSS rule is present in this file or not. So obviously Node.js was the way to go for that. Uh, it fetches the page with uh, Node.js. Creates a browser, uh, uh, simulates a browser with JSON and scopes in a scissor in it, passes the given CSS file and tests for the presence of the CSS selector with document.query selector. After that, it will rewrite the CSS file <coughs> to determine that the CSS rule is used or not used, or if it's used, then uh, what is what, how many selectors are there which are using this rule. If it's very specific, only one or two selectors are using that are using that rule, then we should probably refactor it. This is how we're going with this. This is how we're cleaning up this. It's experimental and it's 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 being done as we talk of actually. Mm. Yeah, I'm done with this. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. questions. So you talk about OCSS, uh, I want to understand what made you do OCSS over frameworks like less OCSS. Um, yes. So the question is that why OCSS and not something like less OCSS? So one thing was we wanted we have people, uh, non UI developers also writing CSS code because we have a lot of things coming up each and every day. So not everything comes to UI developers for writing CSS. So getting them a board less than SAS would be difficult. They're all, they, come, they all come from classical programming areas where inheritance is reusing the code, but it's actually not that in less than SAS. It will actually duplicate the code we do. So we had a, we, we had a fear that this would actually result in more code generated this way. But we are actually trying this and we are trying it for the CSS properties because it's actually, we find it's perfect to declare this 
the uh, radius properties and gradients each and every time. So let's say that we are actually not considering pieces elements, let's say that less elements or less elements. We are not talking about that, but yes. consider the redundancy that you have to deal with. Yes. Uh, like if you are giving it by the margin and the floats, which you actually adapt the framework, yes. they are given and provided. Um, so if, yeah. if you if you continue using that, that probably will not even fall into scenario where you have to deal with for redundancy. So the only thing is a call initially when you make it better, we spend time clearing our rules and redundancy later on just because we have to make it accessible to our dash so that we can understand or do it more wisely. I, 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 so so the so thing is that if you we want first clean up our code because it's way it's it's we are downloading like 80 GBs of CSS on every page, we want to clean up first and then we would uh, think about it, rewriting it with uh, or re rethinking it with slash or less. Another thing is that even if you have margin padding with less, people will simply inherit that and they will they will not they will not think that it's a reference. It will be actually a one more recollection of that property there. Okay. So you're saying that you had some architecture running Already on your CSS and that's yes. why you have got that OCSS. Yes, yes. But if you have to start on, uh, let's say from the scratch, would yes. you rather still not use less framework and should you do? Know? Uh, I think OCSS works for most of our things actually. We okay. don't find that anything yeah. apart from this, uh, the CSS three rules, we would want to less for the XS part. Yeah, sure. Are you planning to open source the CSS three um, Yeah, mm -hmm. we do plan to contribute back. To so the question is, are we planning to open source this CSS cleanup tool? We do plan to do it. We do plan to contribute back. Uh, I wrote it uh, using the code of a popular Firefox add-on called CSS Dusty Selectors or something. So I I actually did that code and we did this. Is this on uh, It's not there right now, but we do plan to put it out. Um, anything else? Yeah. What is the current font size? Pardon? What is the current font size? Yeah, so the font sizes, so the question is what are our current font sizes? No, no, stack. 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 Okay, so I'm really not sure of the font age, but I think it's pretty science. I think it's pretty science. I think it's pretty science. Initially, the font sizes we got the values were like 200 KBs for strong, 200 KBs for a bold font. So it resulted in like 500, around 500 KB downloading on each and every page load. Then it came down to like just uh, 40 KBs overall. When you're talking about web fonts, uh, you, you, you spoke about not using Google web fonts because it's a specific clause and not to deal with additional price gaming. Yes. Still using web phones, uh, that scenarios, you know, if you have a let's say using embedding and handwriting and all that phone in area. Yes. So if a person who does not who access the website for first time, yes. unless that embedded phone has has rendered or has actually come to the picture, yes. people not going to be area. So yes. there is there is a you know section of setting where you see the fluctuation as switching between the phones. So that did you use any script to deal with that? No, we don't use so we technology follow with that is the way we deal with the power test that we will will not display the font. That's how browsers see data, that's how people recommend it because it fits the other way than the, the again the size of area and the, the size of characters in area and the font we use is different. So the page might jump a lot. We don't want it jumping. So we we actually hide the font. We hide the text. In the time the font goes. Anything else? Uh, what are the five moves that you would say that you use daily? Sure, sure. So the question is uh, what are the five moves we use to uh, five most five use tools we use to for a content needs? Uh, so we use uh five we use this um, the page test a lot, we use uh, this Actually, this Opera has a very good developer tools set which helps us profile our CSS that we use a lot. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's Firefly or something. It touches Dragonfly. Yeah, Dragonfly. It touches profile the CSS and performance of the CSS filters. Anything else? Have you considered accessibility? Yeah, it's true. Accessibility. Pardon? Have you considered accessibility for the website? Accessibility? No, not yet. Actually, we want to go into that. We we are actually we actually plan to write a code in a much more we we, we actually plan to write write in a much more schematic schematic tags and we want to make it more accessible. It's not accessible right now, it's not that much accessible right now, but we will plan to make it. Yes. So Okay, so Pushkar, uh, like, so this is the Indian e-commerce situation in India, like, support highly secure. Yes. And you're also the great guide in building things yourself, like, yes, yes, yes. yes. So, if you are doing these two things, like, building things yourself and supporting the Indian e-commerce situation so well, then you're going to open source all this stuff that you're doing. We do plan to do it. It's, it's going to happen soon. So, the question is, when do we do we plan to open source all the things we do ourselves? Again, you might have heard it from previous conferences, previous speakers. We do plan to contribute back. There will be a point we would, uh, when, it, when we find them, speak with ourselves. These things, they are not in experimental stage. We will open source. We will do it. Soon, next week. Yes. I cannot do it. Not so much on that. <laughs> but soon. Uh, Okay, um, anything else? Um, cool, so we're done. Thank you.